Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Will you fasten your seatbelts for takeoff, please? Thank you. Kia ora, hello, and welcome to Sound Salad, where we toss around all things spoken and all things heard. Brought to you by Audiobooks New Zealand, New Zealand's leading producer of audio content. We hope that you will have a pleasant journey, and if we can add to your comfort in any way, please do not hesitate to press the call bell. Hello there listeners, kia ora tato. I'm Romy Hooper. Welcome to the first episode of Sound Salad, where we talk up all things spoken and all things heard. So I'm coming to you live uh, well, remotely, really, from my wardrobe, um, probably the most common space you'll find an audiobook narrator or voice artist, before they've landed a Coca-Cola campaign and funded their own suite. <laughs> so I'm here with a uh, good mate, Theo Gibson of Audiobooks NZ. Hello there. Hello. <laughs> so I don't know how you're sort of set up. I've got my coats on one side and I'm using one of my mum's old flat 80s clutches as a stand for my mic, but... um. We're good to go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of set up here in my kind of like makeshift sleep out thing that I built many years ago, which is very damp, but uh, works quite well as a external office for uh, podcast yeah. and audiobook recordings. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> we set up where we need to. Really. Yeah, we exactly. Set up where we need to. Exactly. Um, so, well, essentially, the whole uh, this whole idea for Sound Salad came about when. Um, Good mate Theo, founder and creator of Audiobooks NZ. Oh. Um, actually, we we had a bit of a conversation about the fact that there weren't really any good podcasts out there about audiobooks or about audiobooking. There are a couple that are from like overseas, and granted, it is a bit of a niche audience, mm. but. Um, Basically, Theo just asked if I wanted to do one. Yeah. So for the audio slash bibliophiles among us or <laughs> the lovers of oral storytelling, um, but also so that there's a bit more that comes up when you look up podcasts about audiobooks rather yeah. than just audiobooks released in a podcast format. Totally, totally. Because, yeah. I mean, you know, if you look out there at the moment, you know, audiobooks traditionally have been kind of promoted quite widely f- through America, you know, and, and that's great. But, you know, if you're looking for anything outside of that, um, other than a book, you know, an audio book review, there's no one really kind of talking about the ins yeah. and outs of it, you know? Yeah. So I'm, I'm glad yeah, you're doing it, totally. Romy. And, you know, <laughs> the whole book review thing. Yeah. Oh, good. I'm glad. I'm glad too. <laughs> I mean, no doubt there'll be some kind of book reviewing that comes in and along the way, but probably yeah. more from the perspective of the narrators that are um, having to read them. So, you know, um, <laughs> it was, a, yeah. And so from there, it was kind of, all right, so what will it all be about? Um I work personally as an audiobook narrator for Blind Low Vision NZ, um, both self-recording and with engineers, and on occasion for Audiobooks NZ as well. Yeah. Um, and sure, we do talk about some interesting stuff, often our very blatant opinions about what we're reading at the time. <laughs> Currently, myself, I have Judith Collins, Pull No Punches, which is a delightful read. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping that we've sort of been able to come up with something that can have sort of vast appeal for writers, publishers, narrators, engineers, um, m- musicians, gamers, anyone who has an appreciation of things spoken and things heard, essentially. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> so um, we'll be speaking with some awesome minds and voices on the subjects that audio content can raise, but to start off with, I figured that we might as well take a little stroll down Papa Lane and start from the very beginning, um, where we actually went from learning how to lay down recorded sound at all um, to now, where we essentially hold mini libraries in our pockets. I yeah, totally. It's um, come a long way. Oh my lord, has it? What? And it's so, like honestly, this research has been really fascinating for me because I. I had a lot of assumptions about where recorded sound came from and then really looking into it, there's so many different like socioeconomic reasons and, and, you know, just necessities as to why we have spoken audio in general. Um, So to start with it, spoken audio, like, you know, audio books or anything like that have been available in schools and public libraries and stuff and a couple of music shops since around the thirties. Um, And they were made available prior to the sort of age of cassettes, compact discs, and downloadable audio. But generally, 
he only has poetry and plays and short texts, which are reasons of which I'll go into later. Um, it wasn't until the 80s that it really began to attract book retailers. And then book retailers finally cottoned on to the fact that they were their own thing, their own entity, and started displaying them separately as audiobooks on bookshelves. Um, the actual term talking book, though, came into being in the 1930s, hmm. mainly through government programs designed for blind readers. So I always knew that that was a, um, a thing. thing. The, whole, the whole talking book program has been something that's been spoken about up at, up at work for a long time. Um, and I know that it's changed a lot of people's lives, actually. So, we'll, yeah, we'll be, we'll be doing a little bit more investigation into that. Um, but the actual term audiobook didn't come into use until the 70s wow. when it was basically the shift from um, audio cassettes which replaced records, vinyl yes. records. I yeah. mean, my, my first audio audio book or talking book that I had was on record. You know, that's where I kind of found my found my love for audio books. Yeah, that's so. Or I, I, you know, I just love the thought of thinking about people like sitting around and tuning into radio dramas and things. Oh, like, totally. I can just imagine listening to it on vinyl, though. Like, yeah. I have to say, that's probably one of my favorite favorite mediums to listen through you oh, know it's, like there's it's nothing beautiful like it. yeah it's totally beautiful i mean uh during uh, new zealand's first lockdown we're currently in our second second lockdown we're just about to finish mm. um i pulled out all my uh, uh vinyl recordings that i had when i was a kid and played them to nice. my son and he was awesome. just basically mem- mesmerized for you know two days which was great yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Two days, you're winning. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Two days a piece. It was good. Oh, it's such a good time, eh? Nostalgia. Love yeah. it. Yeah. Right. Well, um, so in terms of like, so we, we move a little bit into the technical side of things, but I actually found this really interesting because it just it seems so bizarre to me, to be honest. Um, this this sort of thing that Thomas Edison achieved. Uh, so the spoken word recordings first became possible with the invention of his phonograph in 1877. Um, And he actually, originally when he invented this machine, he had phonographic books in his mind. Um, Pardon me. He had a sort of um, provocation, which is a quote that he said to himself. Um, He wanted to find a way to um, speak to blind people without effort on their part. Right. Which I think is, you know, I mean, obviously it's a very, you know, simple statement to make, but yeah. in terms of actually how you're going to go about that, um, <laughs> big, big movements. So um, the the first words that he spoke into the phonograph were his recital of Mary Had a Little Lamb. <laughs> it was the first instance of recorded verse. Wow. And it's, um, yeah, I've been, I've been trying to hunt down the actual original. I think that we'll, we'll probably be able to find it eventually for you. Um it sounds horrific. It is so, <laughs> so hard to, to understand anything. Like, it's yeah, just, yeah, yeah. It's so weird. Um, but so then um, afterwards in 1878, a, a demonstration at the Royal Institute in Britain included Hey Diddle Diddle, The Cat and the Fiddle. And then a single line of Tennyson's poetry, which kind of segmented the association with technology and spoken literature. So it sort of started to kind of become something that, a lot of people were, were sort of experimenting with or, you yeah. know, doing a bit more looking into. But this is the this is the thing that is just whack to me, is um, many of the short spoken word recordings were sold on cylinders in the late 1800s and early 1900s. And I looked these up because I was like, what the <laughs> hell is that even about? <laughs> um, but they basically, they kind of look like these oversized batteries. Yeah. Um, and they were hollow cylindrical objects that would have an audio recording embossed on the outside of it, which could only really be reproduced when they were played on the um, mechanical cylinder phonograph, obviously. So Thomas Edison invented them both in 1877. um, And he did have a successful recording and reproduction of intelligible sounds. um, And it was when he and his team used a thin sheet of tinfoil wrapped around a hand-cranked groove metal cylinder um, so, wow! I I, yeah, I. There are actually like examples on on YouTube of people having fabricated a similar kind of um, setup. setup and f- tried to figure out, you know, how on earth that was sort of uh, where they got to in their thinking. Yeah, I thought. Yeah, yeah. Um, but anyway, he realised that that wasn't really uh, the most successful material, so moved on to different studies like producing an incandescent 
electric light, or did he? <laughs> something, something a bit easier. Yeah, <laughs> or, yeah. <laughs> or did he? <laughs> um, but so it was about seven years later when Charles Sumner Tainter, Alexander Graham Bell, and Chichester Bell introduced wax instead as the recording medium. Um, and they had a bit more sort of uh, specificity, I suppose, with their yeah. engraving as their recording method. So then Thomas gets all excited again and goes, <laughs> mm, I'm ever eager to impress the media. So he scurries back to his lab and he works on his phonograph again. Um, he kind of settled on the basic phonograph, like the perfected phonograph, so to speak, that was yeah. commercialized and used by um, settling on a thicker all wax cylinder in the end. Wow. Um and he kind of had a sort of sustainability thing in his mind, I suppose, because yeah. the way he viewed it was that straight after the the engravings from that wax cylinder were finished, someone had listened to it, he could shave the wax off and then start again. Wow. Which is quite, yeah, I know, just like, yeah. The, and I guess the, wax the would have been quite, is. yeah, it would have been cheaper at the time than, you know, uh, well, totally. metals. Yeah, yeah, totally. And, you know, com- generally speaking, completely recyclable, really, yeah, yeah. Uh, to, to a certain extent. So. Wow. Pretty interesting. Um, oh. So then, so that that basically, the, all of those components made his, in his mind, his perfected phonograph, which was commercialized in 1888, and it was pretty widely used within a few years. So oh. um, that's pretty impressive. Um, his first recording, like his first sort of, you know, um, musical sort of recording or attempt at, was titled "The Lost Chord," and I found it here for you. So we'll give it a play. So um, the biggest issue with these cylinders was that they were limited to about four minutes each, which made books not just impractical, it made them impossible, really. Um, (laughs) But then the flat, flat platters, or what they were called flat platters, which essentially we know as records, vinyl records, um, increased to 12 minutes. But this was also still a bit tricky for anything longer. Um, so there was one instance, there was a um, a quote that I found, and actually this has been reiterated by, there was an article I found by the guys that run Audible who um, said that they recalled um, when someone took out, I think, oh, what was it, in someone's first like re- like rental or, you know, hiring out of an audiobook, they, they got the Bible and it would have to be in a wheelbarrow. <laughs> You know, like just because there were so many discs. Oh, here it is. So one early listener complained that he would need a wheelbarrow to carry around talking books recorded on discs with such limited storage capacity. (laughs) (laughs) Amazing. It's so funny. the actual quality of them sounded a bit like this. So that recording was an electro-typed copper negative disc that was delivered to the Smithsonian Institute in 1881 in a little tin box. If you can't hear exactly what is being said, which I can't imagine that you can, <laughs> it's a dude that's counting to six. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't have much time. Yeah, they yeah, yeah. Okay, I want you to count to ten. <laughs> I couldn't make it. I couldn't make couldn't it. make it. The cylinder, it stopped. That's um, funny. So by the 1930s, close grooved records increased to 20 minutes, making possible longer narrative. Woohoo! Wow. So with some of the nitty gritty of that tech side figured out, um, finally in come some of the organisations to administer the whole ordeal. Um, and namely, and which is sort of what I was expecting to find when I was first sort of researching, um, the American Foundation for the Blind in 1931 and boom so multiple um countries obviously established their own foundations for the blind went through whatever they needed to go through with her royal majesty to become royal foundations of the blind or anything like that um but yeah generally speaking it was the the blind foundations who um sort of stepped up to the plate you know and i suppose rightfully so yeah yeah Um, so With them came the Talking Books program, which, like I said, it's changed a lot of lives. Um, Though it was, and though though it was started by the Adult Blind Project and the Library of Congress Books, 
It was more in response to the urgency to provide content to injured veterans from World War One. Yeah, I was thinking like, of that. Just mm. just as much as as and as well as um, visually impaired adults. But you know, I found that quite interesting. Um, the first test recordings in 1932 included a chapter from Helen Keller's Midstream and Edgar Allan Poe's The Raven. Wow. I'm hoping to find samples, so I will get to some of them. So then the first recordings made for distribution happened through the Talking Box program again. So that was in 1934 when obviously they'd sort of, you know, figured out how to be able to, you know, dish out these longer, longer... Longer um, recordings, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so they included sections of the Bible, the Declaration of Independence, and some other patriotic documents, plays and sonnets by Shakespeare, of course, <laughs> um, As the Earth Turns by Gladys Hasty Carroll. I'm unsure actually why it was that that was the first, because it's been referenced multiple times as having been the first book that was chosen, you know, as as it's in its entirety, I suppose. Well, to, maybe to be it was just popular at the of, time, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah totally. I'll, I'll need to do some looking up as to what it's actually about. To yeah, be honest. yeah. I didn't, I didn't get a chance to, but um, yeah, as well as um, some other um, plays and works by Rudyard Kipling, John Macefield, um, P.G. Wodehouse, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Mm. So then we progress more um, into blind and dyslexic um, territory, which was obviously, you know, that's, I mean, goodness gracious, the level of research still going on into dyslexia yeah. and every single different kind of um, visual impairment that can come as a byproduct of all different kinds of dyslexic conditions. Mm. Um, so they, um, essentially the, the foundation for blind and um, dyslexic exploration, I suppose, was later named the Learning Ally. Um, it was founded in 1948 by an epic babe, in my opinion, <laughs> called... <laughs> She sounds so right. She's, oh, she just sounds great, eh? Um, <laughs> Anne T. MacDonald. So she was a member of the New York Public Library's Women's Auxiliary. Oh, right. Um, so similar to the Talking Books program, um, she basically sort of set, set up RFBD or Blind, uh, well, Royal Foundation of Blind, Dys- bl- sorry, Royal Foundation of Blind and Dyslexic. Such pretty names. <laughs> um in a, in, a, in a similar sense, in um, response to inquiries from soldiers who'd lost their sight in combat wow. during uh, this time, during World War II. Um, so obviously texts were mostly inaccessible to recently blinded veterans. And indeed, actually, you know, anyone that wasn't born blind, you know, who um, has to actually confront what it is to try and continue to ascertain and absorb content... Um, you know, anyone who hadn't grown up reading Braille uh, or, or weren't used to using live readers, which were, you know, before the invention of Walkman and things like that, yeah. were completely bizarre things to have in the household. They weren't usual things to, to use um, and even harder to attempt to get to use um, once you had obviously, you know, recently lost your sight. So yeah, yeah. that was that, that that was another big thing, actually, back then. Um, it's learning it was, a whole it, new it, language again, isn't it? It's like, absolutely. Yeah. Totally. Totally. Yeah. And I mean, it, it's... Another big thing was that it was one thing to have the material, you know, they, they, they try all of these technological advancements to try gain the material, mm. but it's another thing entirely to have a way to listen to it, you know, to have some radio set up or some, you know, I mean, yeah, phonograph essentially. You'd need to have, you know, a, a phonograph of your own, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, so Anne bandied all of her auxiliary gals together and they decided to turn the attic of the New York Public Library into a studio. Wow. And they started recording textbooks, mainly just textbooks, uh, using six-inch vinyl soundscriber phonograph discs. Mm. Problem with that, again, we've got with the good old technology side yeah. of things, they only held about 12 minutes or so per yes. side. Yes. Um, but in, in 1952, she did manage to uh, do the same and open more recording studios in about seven or so um, other cities across the United States. So she was somewhat of a pioneer in that sense. Um she leads me into the sort of business of the books and the main reason being because of another epic babe, in my opinion, um, 
So one of the first sort of businesses, I suppose, that was, you know, for the production of audiobooks and that wasn't necessarily affiliated to a blind or um, or other sort of service um, was Cademan Records. So they were considered the seed of the audiobook industry. So they were the first to <laughs> wow. be dedicated. I know, right? <laughs> How does it feel to be seen? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so, so, so they were the first ones dedicated to selling spoken work recordings just wow. to the public. Yeah. And this is what I love about it. Um, it was formed in New York in 1952 by college graduates and besties, Barbara Holdridge and Marianne Roney. Babes both. Here's why. <laughs> they, they were an entirely female-owned and run company in the early 50s who had the power because of their company to stress gender equality conversations in their um, content selections. Mm. And they chose to audio, like, well, yeah, they, they chose strategically to audio publish, ma- pardon me, uh, to audio publish mainly female authors and to, um, to release them strategically so that certain voices were really um, available and yes. represented within their library um, and, yeah, within their catalogue as a whole, wow. as well as starting somewhat of a massive movement in the tech sphere as well, you know, um, to be one of the first that, well, to be the first that aren't affiliated to um, any other entity to just completely go, sweet as, we believe that there's enough of a of an audience, that there's enough of a business in this thing and, you know, we went and studied business so we might as well go do it. Yeah. I think well, that's pretty incredible. It's pretty um, cool. I mean, what's amazing about that though, just from a purely nerdy perspective, is it's, yeah. it's not like they had the option to to um, to edit these recordings or anything. They were no, basically pressing that one one take wonder. It was like, you know, that that's what it was, you know. I know. Mm, I know. Amazing. It's just like so, so impressive. But mm. I think as well, you know, um, based on that time, there was a lot more consideredness around yes. communications. You yeah. know, I think anything that I've, um, you know, I've, I've found a couple of um, really old samples and I've been going through the old BBC um, website because they've released all of their sound effects that they've used, I'm pretty sure ever. There's like <laughs> over 26,000 sounds there. It's I amazing. can imagine. But just hearing, you know, old announcements from the train or something you know there's so much more pace given and so much more um every word is heard just every word is heard you know the eloquence and everything was just i mean it's it's kind of lovely and wonderful to listen to now honestly though if i heard it at the actual train station i'd be like can you hurry up what are you doing (laughs) you're about to miss your train yes oh god you know yeah yeah (laughs) yeah um but okay so basically another little sort of story of their uh tenacity those two gals was um they they were both fans of dylan thomas as a poet and heard that he was going to speak at the 92nd Street YMCA. So they kind of stalked him down and uh, (laughs) arrived with a business proposition. He wasn't really that well known before. So, okay, actually, technically, his work wasn't even physically published in book form at that point, but they loved his work, and they just said, turn up and we will just record you speaking your work in your own words and... We'll just go from there and see what happens, lol. You know? (laughs) And he was just like, oh, okay, why not? You know, and who knows? Who knows how instrumental they were potentially in being able to put him on the map as an author? You know, I don't don't know. But from that, uh, from that, and there's this wonderful irony to this story as well, is that the actual most successful and loved story Mm -hmm. that was on the LP was its B-side, which... Thomas himself didn't even remember the title of what it was when he was asked to do it. They just said, we need more for the B-side. And he was like, what? I don't even know. This is a bit of a random one. <laughs> um, but, but it's called A Child's Christmas in Wales. And it became one of the most popular, um, most loved stories of his wow. at that time. Anyway, wow. which is cool. But it, so it launched him at potentially maybe i choose to believe so because they seem like cool chicks um and 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 it launched them cademan into a successful company wow. so yeah they were kind of the first actual official audiobook making or like production company but again the time restrictions thing yeah it seems like this was a handbrake that kind of was pulled every few years when it comes to the development through um through all of these sort of different catalogs and 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 the building of their libraries Mm. so they were mainly restricted to doing poetry and plays and short stories and such like that 
um, anything that could limit to 45 minutes, basically. I think that was, that was you know, an LP time was 45 yes. minutes. Yeah. And then <laughs> into the 60s in the cassette tape. <laughs> Sounds simple to go there of some kind of cute sting. <laughs> so um, a few libraries, like the Library of Congress, began distributing books on cassette by 1969. But during the 70s, technology had shifted and people had wanted more. Go us. So we, <laughs> so we wanted to not only be able to hear more, like for longer, but we wanted to be able to hear it on the road, yeah. walking the dog while we were on the bus. So along came the Walkman and cassette players being put into cars for the first time. Wow. Oh well, yeah. I, well it was it was kind of a track and then cassette, wasn't it? Totally. It was, yeah, yeah. Wow. Do you remember what was your first cassette? Oh. <laughs> oh, I can't remember. It's I do remember my day. first. This this is going to show my age, and and don't laugh at me. But I, well, you can laugh at me. I don't mind. Um, I my, one of my beloved um uh, audio book cassette tapes as a kid was uh Thomas the Tank Engine narrated by Ringo Starr, and amazing. Um, it was oh amazing. God, I want now it. he only did Thomas the Tank Engine for a short period of time, but they obviously you know they were short <laughs> stories. So, but just having Ringo Starr reading Thomas the Tank Engine was amazing. And I can yeah, remember the day it got crunched in the tape player because the <gasps> heads were dirty, and I was like distraught for weeks. It oh was, no, it was a very sad day. Yeah. Oh my god, <laughs> I think mine was like Hanson or something. You know, <laughs> like when I first was able to. I mean, they back then. Now I was what. God, when I would have got that, I would have been probably five or six or something like maybe I don't know six, seven, eight. So, so remember. the Walkman was was the Walkman came out. The Sony released the first Walkman uh, the year I was born, which I think was nineteen eighty two. Right. Yeah. So okay. the first portable Walkman. You know, the they were in portable. cars. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, it became like a kind of reason for the road trip, really. Yeah, eh? yeah, just, totally. just to be able to go and listen, really. Um, and interestingly, though, <laughs> what I find interesting, I mean, the, these were some like largely American stats, which I'll get to um, some others later, but the most popular thing listened to at that point in time in cassette player, you know, ca- cars and yeah. cassette players and cars were instructional recordings. And there were two top sellers. Managing and selling companies, which was 12 cassettes that you got for 300 bucks, or executive seminar in sound, which was like 60, uh, about, I think, five or so 60 minute long tapes. They didn't have a price on that one, but wow. I just thought, gosh, can you imagine just like all of those? All of those interstate people that are just kind of traveling all day or whatever, you know, people just sitting in their cars and those are the two main things that they're listening to, like in terms yeah, of what was so funny. what was the most sold. I think it's just amazing. See, you people know? always laugh at me when I say business books sell quite well, you know? <laughs> they do, man. Hey, yeah. well, this is at a time, I mean, I don't know. I don't know why they were the most successful, but, you know, one would have assumed that there would wow. have been... I don't know, any number of other kind of, um, you know, audio publications that w- would have been potentially a bit more entertaining or enjoyable, but wow. never mind. Uh, so by this point, I, essentially, I guess, you know, and, and prior to this, I think companies were latching on to the fact that audiobooks weren't just for the visually impaired or yes. weren't just for people who struggled with, um, you know, reading the written word. Mm. There was a far wider audience. So this leads us on to where they actually start to give a shit, really, yeah, about what it yeah. sounds like. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, so they finally started to think about performance and narration and began to hire actors to do mainly a few abridged bestsellers. Um, so, the, yeah, I think at, at this point still doing the full bestsellers wasn't really on the cards from what mm. I can understand. But companies like Books on Tape, which was actually funded by an Olympic sorry founded by an olympic gold medalist oh, really? Hecht, yeah in 1975 so he started a mail order rental service for unabridged audiobooks and supplied a couple of libraries and travelers and commuters essentially became their largest audience um because they were you know able to offer some versions of unabridged um stories through being able to deliver it through mail order um, and, you know, rental and things like that and get it out to far more people. They still exist, um, don't they, books on tape? I'm just thinking. I believe they do. Yeah, I think they do. Um, there's now, gosh. It's They've probably been down. bought by there's someone, about, but uh, it'd be interesting if the, any of the originals are still there. 
Yeah, no, I know. I think I, I have a feeling Books on Tape might be one of the ones that are still going. I can mm-hmm. do a look into that shortly. Yeah. Um, but so he was he was he was around, yes, and then enter his competition. 1978. Henry Trentman. Of course, he was a travelling salesman who listened to these tapes while driving long distances, but he had the idea to basically step it up a notch. He wanted to create higher quality unabridged recordings, specifically unabridged, of classic literature read by more prestigious professional actors. So, yeah, he was obviously reading his, you know, yeah. self-help managing and selling companies. God knows what. Going, this narrator is so dry. I need yeah. to... Totally. Give, give totally. me a bit of personality. Yeah, yeah exactly. And, yeah. you know, the, the end of the 70s, why not? So um, he started his company called Recorded Books, and it was similar in production to Books on Tape, but they basically sort of started working with more production teams, like bringing more people, more expertise on board to be able to make sure that everything sounded and was, you know, as as good as it could possibly be. Mm. Um so then in 19, by 1984, there were about 11 of these audiobook publishing companies. So they included Cademan, so they were still going, Metacom, Newman Communications, Recorded Books, Books on Tape were still going then, uh, and Brilliance. So the companies were small. The largest had, oh, sorry, the largest had a catalogue of only around 200 titles. Yeah. Um, and actual sales from a bookshop weren't really worth it. They were mainly sold through this mail order system that became increasingly popular or or through libraries wow yeah but then again technology advances you know we're getting into the space where there was just leaps and leaps and leaps and bounds yeah (laughs) yeah you know months at, at this point with regards to anything to do with um spoken word recording at all so if we skip to 1984 brilliance audio invented a technique for recording twice as much on the same cassette which was essentially just using both channels of each stereo track. And voila, wow. affordable, unabridged editions, finally. Wow. <laughs> For all those sticklers out there who were against the shortened version, you know, said sticklers to be covered in probably a later episode. Yeah. There's a huge debate on that. Um, of which I must say I probably am one. I can't actually <laughs> imagine having told, like imagine reading Tolstoy or something abridged or like. Oh, totally. I don't know. I mean, I'd like <laughs> The, the Imagine Im- Romeo and Juliet, you know, <laughs> and it starts off with one scene and they're just hanging out, getting to know each other, and the next scene everyone's dying, you know? Yeah, like- yeah. and it's br- abridgments <laughs> is such a personal thing, right? Like, I mean, you know, depending totally. on who's abridging the book, you know, they might not like a particular part, whereas actually the author may think that is the crucial part that you have to Absolutely. have. Absolutely. You know? so Absolutely. I, and, and the amount of people I've spoken with who have, who have listened to abridged copies and, and we've been talking about a book and I said, you know, I really love that bit in the book when this happens, they're like, oh, that, that wasn't in my version. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Totally, yeah. I know. Like it'd be so hard mm. as an author to actually. I mean, for the for the authors that are alive and have any say in it, mm. <laughs> who who do, yeah. who do still get abridged, um, it'd be really really tricky. I, there was um actually another thing that was said um in my researches through um Audible as well, and I think they were they were referencing when they uh, work with editors to abridge that um that there's always obviously two sides to the coin because of the fact that they will always be of the opinion that if you strip anything from a book, you're leaving it with its skeleton. Yeah. Because essentially once it's, it's original publisher, it's original editor, it's original author had gone through everything that they'd gone through to get it to that final published state, which anyone who's written anything ever will know what kind of work that takes, yes. you know, to actually um, discern what's taken away. One would, one, one could suggest that they are being left with a, a bare skeleton that is essentially to be repopulated with slightly different flesh, really, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Which is, Wow. But yeah, there's um yeah there's a that's a huge huge subject matter with regards to all <laughs> of that is, kind of stuff, is, which is. is for a later episode, of course. <laughs> Continuing on with the history lesson. <laughs> so um by September 1985, Publishers Weekly had identified 21 audiobook publishers, and by that point as well, the conven- uh, conventional conventional bigwig publishers like Harper and Row or Random House and Warner Communications were all getting on board as well. Yes. And bookstores had installed audio centers and things for people to listen through. So it was all go. Everyone was sort of, you know, jumping on board. And then 1986 was, I think, probably, in, in my findings, one of the next sort of biggest step-ups um, 
So the Audio Publishers Association is was essentially a group of publishers who bandied together who wanted to promote the awareness of spoken word audio and to be able to get some stats, really, yeah. um, for, for the industry at large. So by that point, lots of book clubs and groups were all offering audio books. It was picking up until Publishers Weekly set aside like a whole regular column for the industry. It was being talked about, um, you know, there were more and more actors that were engaging in this kind of work as well. And then around that time, um, other than just their normal voice, like commercial voice work. Mm. So, but by the year I was born in 1988, there were 40 audiobook publishers. And then by the middle of the 90s, the audiobook publish, sorry, the audiobook publishing business grew to $1.5 billion a year in yes. retail value. Which, like, I, I mean, that's only sort of a four-year period to make that kind of a jump and kind of a shift in um, without that much technological advancement going on then. No. It's more like it was word of mouth around yes. that point. Like, like all of the developments that have been happening from the 50s and stuff like that, people sort of were finally starting to cotton on to it. And, you know, some of those pioneers were arguably maybe only – only really getting a success now, you know, or yeah. later if they were even still around. So, yeah. um, which is kind of interesting. Uh, so, something else I wanted to bring up as well, like in in that, based on just all of these jumps in time um, and technology, is the the transition from vinyl to cassette. Well, no, sorry, from you know, from wax cylinder to vinyl to cassette to CD to MP3 CD to mini disc to digital download like all of those things were so rapid yes you know i i i really i kind of feel for my parents generation like i mean because because they've had to deal with all of that as well as now figuring out the smartphones and yes. you know all of that sort of surreal technology and you know just as much any of the other kind of technologies that are available to um visually impaired or dyslexic people same same you know they've made such rapid developments mm. you know that Every, I mean, you know, it's 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 just it's quite staggering, really, to sort of think about when you just go, "Whoa, that's a that's a quite a considerable amount of like up, like continual digital upskilling." Yes, that totally. People sort of seem to have to continue on with if they want to, you know, be able to keep up. I suppose, or you know, totally. And but what's amazing about the whole thing is is audiobooks themselves, the actual book, the actual way it's been recorded. And mm. and the the end production hasn't really changed. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. you, 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 it's still all about getting the right voice for the right title. You yeah. know, making sure the quality's good, it sounds right. You've got the right feel. That you know, the, the whole production side of things is still very much the same. It's just the medium that it's put on, put out to the yeah. public on. No, absolutely. The, yeah, it's a, yeah. I mean, it's like I I get kind of like inspired and sort of like. I don't know, just instilled with a sense of vigor when I read about a lot of these people that, you know, obviously were doing these sorts of things for the yes. first time. And, you know, um, that sort of perpetual, it's not good enough yet yes. about it. Do you know what I mean? Yes. Like to actually keep, to keep attempting and to keep trying different mediums and different materials just to be able to, you know, essentially be accessible. Yeah. yeah really. You know, totally. which I think audiobook is probably one of the most now one of the most accessible sort of platforms anyway um well i mean, know, I mean I, yeah i mean i remember you know i mean we're, we're at this amazing kind of golden time for audiobooks and i think that's why they're becoming so popular um mm. is that you know now we're into the dig world of digital downloads rather than having to put them on cd or tape or yeah. where we, yeah. we which 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 traditionally had lots of big overheads and then you had to get them out to stores and 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 but now we don't have a time limit we can do a 50 hour audio book and the difference the difference in 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 that going on your smart smartphone is a very small amount of data that goes on your smartphone you know yeah, like totally yeah. so we're, we're you know like i remember listening to lord of the rings on cd when i was i don't know 12 or 14 or something and it yeah. was a 10 cd set you yeah, know what yeah, i mean sure. you hit, yep. it took up the entire glove box of the car Oh, you yeah, know, man. Um, Encyclopedia Britannica. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, <laughs> like, gone, gone are those limits, you know, which is really yeah. exciting. I mean, uh, you know, I mean, uh, we've we've recently been having requests um, at Audiobooks NZ for the Samoan Bible, and we're like, well, we can do it. You know, yeah. <laughs> we can do yeah. it. It's gonna, it's still gonna it. take us a long time, but we can do it. And yeah. uh, 
you know, the end product might be a 30-hour audio book, but, um, you know. Uh, but, it's, but it's accessible. It's, it's accessible. And it's there for you, yeah. totally. I mean, yeah, yeah. this is um, – actually, that next point was um, uh, the – Yes, that's right. It's that, it's that quote that I found that I was referencing before. Um, Christopher Platt, the New York Public Library Chief Branch Officer, um, said that the that the biggest change for audiobooks was actually the move from cassette tapes to CD players in cars. Mm, mm. Um, and he recalled that an entire suitcase of cassette tapes, uh, when when someone checked out an audio version of the Bible. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, like in terms of yeah, like in terms of it taking up the entire glove box in your car. Like, yeah. You know, just the that. Um, that real ease that we have now to just be able to just, you know, chuck something in and, and, and just receive story or yeah. receive someone talking to us, you yeah. know, yeah. in, in any capacity, it doesn't matter what they're saying, but, um, well, we, well, yeah, we, can, I, we can deserve to be picky now, which is quite a, you know, totally, like, I mean, absolutely. you know, we are, we are in the era of, of Netflix and, and, da- and instantaneous downloadable content. So, you know, if it doesn't, it doesn't sound good, we're not going to listen to it. <laughs> no, I know exactly. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. that's why I found it interesting, you know, in terms of people like, there are a lot of references to people taking out multiple different versions of the Bible, you know, and mm. just, you know, thinking about the quality of the audio on an entire suitcase of cassette tapes or an entire wheelbarrow of them from earlier on. Yes. Or, or like, you know, an, an, an entire wheelbarrow of um, those 12 minute long uh, flat discs. You know, I'm just like, I, it, I mean, I mean, they <laughs> but, had to back then. Yes. Like, right. They yeah. didn't have the option. No. But like, far out. Yeah. Yeah. My God. Like, where we've, where we've come to be able to not have to is insane, you know. But how, how many, like, have, have you ever at Audiobooks NZ, have you ever done a, a, a version of the Bible? No, no, we're planning to. We're right. hoping. We're ho- we were hoping to do one prior to to COVID. Um, yes, sure. But that that'll probably be pushed out till maybe end of this year and beginning of next, depending yeah, on right. who wants to do it with us. But um, yeah, totally. uh, that we have had many requests for the Bible in different languages, not not English. I mean, there's yeah, lots of sure. English versions out there, and you can probably, to be honest, you can probably just jump on get one from your public library on audio yeah, at the totally. moment in English. But yeah. um, but yeah, other languages not so much. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, right. I mean, you know, I just... we're a multi, pretty multicultural in New Zealand, so we've kind of got a lot of requests for a lot of different languages. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, we've had the same up at um, Blind Low Vision NZ. Actually, mm, mm. I was just curious because I wondered, you know, in terms of that conversation of the length of things, how long an actual, you know, because like a standard audio book will be. I don't know. I'd probably spend maybe what around like eleven hours or so, depending on the size. Yeah, and then that 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 gets down to around eight hours or so. Yeah, I would that... say six to eight is your average length of an audio yeah. book. I would say, and it's, pr- yeah. it's it's quite a good length. Like, it, I mean, it depends w- how you listen. I mean, everyone listens to audio books differently these days. But yeah, like I, I I tend to listen while I'm driving places. Um, and you know, you get through a good kind of forty five minutes at, at a at a trip or something like that totally, you know? yeah. and so that, 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 that yeah yeah especially given all the <laughs> and and you know so that that ultimately kind of works out to a week's worth of listening or maybe if you're a real audiobook nerd you might get through two to a, to a week if you're really yeah, committed yeah. you know yeah 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah i'd be i'd be fascinated to see how long um that uh, hour you know what like whatever the the version is that we yeah. end up with from you know the new zealand kiwi accent i'm sure that there is one from up the blind foundation yeah 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 figure out who did it yeah figure out who did it and get him on the show yeah totally (laughs) totally because i mean the blind foundation i mean there's there's uh, there's thousands of thousands uh, hundreds hundreds of actors who have worked with the blind foundation over the years isn't there and i mean you know i mean they've got some iconic voices reading some of their works i know i know i'm gonna get some snippets and things and hopefully you know be able to talk to some of those guys as well bring them in it'd be it'll be cool to get their voices on on this subject that's for sure yeah yeah so Anyway, back to it. So uh, our cassette tapes were ultimately around 2002 was when cassettes were sort of on their way out, pretty much. Uh, CDs took over steadily and peaked in their sales around 2008. Then they declined again steadily, but in favour of digital downloads and have been sort of slowly exiting stage left since around 2012, really. Um, But now it gets fun because we're at the section of the history lesson that involves the internet. Yay! Yay! (laughs) (laughs) Don't we love that? Uh So so obviously you've got like, you know, 
download speeds full stop, least of all farther, faster download speeds. You've got broadband, et cetera, et cetera. Um, our, our mates at Audible decided to get on board and make its own digital media player, the Audible player, in 1997, which uh, it could only hold two hours of audio. It was like uh, four gigabytes or something, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was, it was smaller and lighter than a Walkman, but it, it did cost you around 200 bucks. So, you know, you'd want to probably get... I don't know. You'd you'd be wanting to like recycle the two hours of content that you had on there quite consider you know quite a lot I suppose. So either way, gone would be the snail mail uh, delivery system and waiting for cassettes or CDs. Instead, you can download to your heart's content from unlimited online libraries. Audible.com though was the first actual website for being able to purchase them. Yes. Uh, and then uh, Hugh Maguire took us a bit further when he asked a question on his blog. Can the net harness a bunch of volunteers to help bring books to the public domain to life through podcasting? Big question, but the whole um, the whole sort of uh, audio book being released as podcast format will be something that we can um, that we'll we'll cover in a in a later episode in a bit more detail. But he basically is the creator of LibriVox, so he created that in two thousand five. It was a site that had the first public domain audio books entirely read by volunteers. Mm. So one could say, I mean, I don't know, I'm an audiobook narrator who came at it from the, you know, angle of training in speech and drama or, you know, as an actor. Um, one, one could hazard a guess as to what the quality is of the recordings if they're done by volunteers. I've, I've, I've done a few listens to LibriVox um, books myself, and I think that they're awesome. Uh, like in terms of the fact that they are all volunteers, sometimes I'm super, super surprised by that. Do you know what I mean? You're kind well, of there, like, there's wow. some professional narrators on there too who actually do LibriVox books, you know, who just want to yes. narrate a particular book and they want to yeah. practice or whatever. And they, you know, so there's some pretty good narrators on there. Yeah, totally. So, I mean, essentially, like the answer to his question was yes. Mm. <laughs> um, you know, can you harness a bunch of volunteers to help bring books to the public domain via the net, you know, and so he did. So by the end of 2017, there were over 12,000 works in his catalogue and he's producing around a thousand or so a year, I think I found, which is yeah, it, which is just immense. You yes. know, that is, that is a lot. To, I mean, how many books would you guys make in a year? Oh, I don't know. We're, we're you know, we're probably only, to what, 20 or 40 or something like that? And I think Blind Foundation's, what, only like 90 books or something? Something so, like that. Yeah. It's nowhere near a 1,000. Like, no. that is an, a, that, that, that's an incredible epic. amount of content. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, um, well, and, with, you know, with us, obviously, throughout the most of the past decade, we've also been a customer, like, you know, acclimatizing ourselves, I suppose, to our mobiles, to our smartphones, our tablets, entertainment systems in cars or um, connected car platforms, I think they're called. Um, audio drama recordings are making a bit of a comeback too. Yeah. Um, which obviously is funny, they, they, which is where it all kind of started in a way. I know. <laughs> I know. Obviously, we kind of went through the sort of technological advancements and stuff, and I stuck mainly to audio books as a history on them. But, you know, radio drama, obviously, mm. actors were – and, you know, I kind of referenced this right at the beginning of our chat – just the thought of a whole family sitting down and tuning into radio drama – is just such a beautiful thought to me. Like, it just makes yes. me feel like roast chicken on a Sunday and <laughs> baked bread and shit, you know? Like, it, it's, it's, such a, it's such a cool thing to do. And, I mean, you know, there have been live versions of that. Like, I know um, down at the Basement Theatre, they put on, you know, live stage readings of, um, of screenplays and stuff like that. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. So it's, it's, it's essentially no different. It's yes. like, you know, play readings or... or um, the difference is you get to play readings, with, you know. with, with, with Foley and sound effects and have a bit, totally, of, a bit of fun exactly. with it, you know? Yeah. I know. I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of, yeah, it's funny. So like, um, apparently what was it? Re uh, just recently, when was it? Um, uh, oh no, I can't, I don't think I'll be able to find it. I think it was, um, Audible released a couple of, Hmm, a couple of audio dramas. I'll get to it. I'll get to it. Oh, no, wait, there it was. That's right. Um, multiple talent performances. That's what it is. Multiple, yes. Multicast talent performances. Multicast, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, I know Audible did dramatizations of The X-Files, Cold Cases and Stolen Lives, which featured, like, yeah. All the, all the original cast and, members, and not you know, just Audible. Awesome. Like I mean, a lot of a lot of companies have made multicast uh, productions over the years, and some yeah, totally. are, and there are some production companies I think in the US which 
only do multicast. Yes, um, totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. there was, um, I think, the, another example I found was, um, which I thought was quite staggering, actually, but also really cool, um, Penguin Random House's production of George Saunders' Lincoln and the Bardo. So that had 166 narrators work on that, on that multicast talent performance. I mean, how rad would it have been to have been involved in something with like I mean that's that's I insane. would not want to produce that. <laughs> that is that is more than the cast of a normal film yes. or something. Like, you know, that's yes. a lot of people. But that's that's I don't know, I suppose that's sort of testament to what we can do and what yeah, we yeah, are yeah, doing, yeah. you know. So again, yeah, audio drama recordings are making a comeback. Um I remember like um Radio NZ drama, I think fresh out of drama school, a lot of us got the chance to go into Radio New Zealand and and um and record some you know some dramas and stuff like that for them and it was the bee's knees yeah 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 you know it was so much fun yeah just as a performer you know like being no- normally when you're when when you're working on audiobooks you're you know you're essentially you have your tone you have your face you have anything that you can do to kind of um inject more zhuzh into your performance but when you're actually able to kind of stand up and like you know sort of more or less act a lot of it mm. yeah yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah with and 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 also with with your fellow actors rather than just to you know a book obviously you know it, it, it's quite a different experience but totally equally as satisfying in terms of storytelling I yeah think. yeah um yeah so uh there's also I think something else that I thought was interesting to note in 2014 so there's lots of um training options and stuff like that now obviously courses workshops um but the very first university ever to be devoted to audiobook production <clears throat> pardon me uh as I said opened in 2014 by Bob and Deborah Dayan now they run a company called Dayan Audio, I think, over in um, California. Yes. So they called their, um, it's called the Dayan Institute of Vocal Artistry and Technology, which I think is great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Vocal artistry. I mean, come on, she says as she does a big ahem. <laughs> <laughs> so um, leading us sort of, you know, obviously we're now more into today, obviously. So since around 2018, Audiobooks have been growing in sales for about 20%-ish per year. Yeah, and, mate, yeah absolutely. <clears throat> pardon me again. Um, and there are now, obviously, li- literally hundreds of initiatives globally that are in place to keep the presence of literature um, alive, I guess, for youth and, and, and for adults. So while, while a lot of these stats and things like that were mainly for America, other countries followed suit in a, in a largely similar way, just a little bit later on, really. Yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> Pardon me again. Uh, so Germany founded the West German Audiobook Library for the Blind, uh, again, starting from the same initiative of, you know, um, being able to um, make literature more accessible for the blind and low vision community. That was in 19, 1955, sorry. And they had actors from the, I love this, they had actors mm. from the Municipal Theatre in <laughs> Münster. Is that Münster? M-U-N-S-T-E-R? Yeah. We'll Munster, yeah. yes, recorded the first audiobooks for the visually impaired in an improvised studio that they lined with egg cartons. Love it. We're all very familiar with the egg carton oh, philosophy. Yeah. It is it is a it is a firm it is it is like a religion <laughs> in the in the sound booth scene. Um again, until you have landed Coca Cola campaign and you know <laughs> said ca- said Coca Cola campaign and can fund your own suite, egg cartons. Egg cartons. They they do. They're wonderful things. They're wonderful things. So in this, oh, this these these poor guys um, in, in this municipal theatre um, with their small studio lined with egg cartons had trams rattling past. Classic. It, like all day, every day. Classic. So <clears throat> apparently there were a couple of recordings that they, they, they did release, but they just decided, no, nope, this is bullshit. The quality is too bad. We're actors. We're too, you know, we're, we're, we're not pleased with our performance. Yeah. So, so all of these, all, all of these like initial productions that they did, they all took place at night wow. before they had the dosh for their professional studios Love and whatnot. It. So these actors would essentially, after a long day of work, sit in a freezing cold studio and just read for as long as they could possibly, well, for as long as their voices and their energy could hold, really, which I think is awesome. Hold um, on. I'm, just, I'm sorry, it's Romeo. I'm just going to stop you there. My family's outside my window and they're going to start making lots of sound. Hold on. Yeah. One more page. Yes. Um, 
Uh, sorry, I, I was just going to say that um, you know I think it's it's a, it's a it's like the classic. Anyone who's starting out in vocal audiobook production has to be like first set up by a motorway, a train yeah. line, Always. an airport. You know, just something to really screw up your sound recording. Like when we were getting started, you know, Romy, we did a book with Romy where where we were like right next to a motorway, and every time we got started, the police helicopter hovered oh, over yeah. us. Yeah, that's right. God. So, you know, you've got got to start somewhere. (laughs) I know. It's amazing. (laughs) Uh, Well, Well, so uh, moving steadily along, since 2004, the offerings um, have been recorded for that same entity into DAISY, or Digital Talking Book MP3 um, players, essentially, which provides additional features for visually impaired users mainly uh, to both listen and navigate written material orally. I'm pretty sure they're a global platform for the vision impaired, actually, because mm. we use them here too. I know that... Um, when, was, know, when was the New Zealand Blind Foundation founded? Um, you said that. Let me double check. It was... They were founded... 1890. Really? Yep. The Blind Foundation began in 1890 as the Jubilee Institute for the Blind. Right. Mm, yeah, that was really we early. We didn't. Yeah, totally. But we didn't get our studios. I don't think till like 1928 or something. I'm gonna. Um, okay. I'll be, I'll so be yeah, I was gonna say that. it's all about 1930. They all kind of started showing up, right? Yeah. Well, in terms of, like all of them started showing. Well, the institutions or the foundations for the blind or for visually impaired, I believe, were were going for a very long time before. But that know, was all um, braille and. and but that was all braille yeah. and stuff. So yeah, in terms yeah, okay. of their actual studios, I think it was only when they could physically, actually, well, technically, physically do it, like, yeah. you know, um, so getting, we would have been soon actually, after actually the UK, studios. you know, Britain, yeah, 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 yeah. So uh, hang on, no, I found it anyway, right? So. Um, yeah, so these Daisy Digital Talking Book MP3 players, they're kind of whack-looking little things, they're, you know, but they're essentially a kind of more specialised Walkman, um, so, so to speak. So our own studios here in Auckland, we had 61 talking book machines in New Zealand by 1937. So they were wow. books that we were able to narrate on, um, and 27 of which were supplied to... Oh, sorry. No, no, no. Um, Had 61 talking book machines in New Zealand by 1937, uh, which were those, a a version of those Daisy digital talking book uh, machines so that um, members had had, had the availability to, you know, go and get one and then grab a bunch of audio content and listen to it out of the Jubilee building, I believe. Um, So 27 of those actually were supplied to blinded soldiers by the Commercial Travellers Blinded Soldiers Fund. Wow. Interestingly, yeah. So the, the the institute also had a growing library of talking books, um, special slow-running 12-inch gramophone records, essentially, but each side was only, like, reading for about 25 minutes or so. Wow. And now we're all up there today in our little booths with multiple engineers, and, you know, it's a it's a hectic, busy little space. Um, but we, we record on a software. We don't use Audacity or GarageBand or anything like that. We have a software called Dolphin, which is compatible with the Daisy players and records in that kind of format. So, and, you know, and, doing audio books for the vision impaired is is sli- is a slightly different ta- job, you know, and task just based on those technologies, I think. But And, yeah, very different mm. to what you would make for us, say, if you were doing a commercially available audio book. There's a lot in there yes, that you don't totally. don't that you don't need to do for general 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 release, I should say. Yeah. 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 Totally. So it's very Absolutely. skilled in lots of ways, you guys, what you guys do. <laughs> Yes, well, it's a it's a it's a it's a good service. It's a bloody good service, mm. and um, you know, and they've all been going for so long as yeah. well, which is yeah. you know incredible. Yeah. Um, I think the slowest one to really pick up on the audiobook craze, though, in our sort of contemporary day and age, was India. Interestingly enough, <laughs> um, and from what I gather, it was mainly due to lack of marketing from publishers, and lack of kind of. Um, I suppose excitement about the audiobook format, <laughs> and it only really got popular or began to get popular like a decade ago in 2010 yeah which is crazy i know like (laughs) yeah absolutely so apparently there was there was more and i think this is also to do with the content really i suppose so apparently um largely there was more interest in, in 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 terms of reading any literature of any kind there was more interest if it wasn't in um religious content in either self-improvement or business books 
which yeah. kind of meant that the attitude towards reading potentially in that in that part of the world was more that of education rather yeah, than yeah. entertainment. Yeah. You know, and I think audiobooks are, are I mean, to me, they are most definitely entertainment, whether or not they are educational texts as well. You mm. know, they, 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 they are like primarily for me, you know, they are within my life as as a form of entertainment, you know. Yeah, so, absolutely, escapism, you know. Yeah, Go into totally. your little fantasy fiction wor- fictional yeah. world while you're uh, going to your very, driving to your very boring <laughs> job. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly, yeah, 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 yeah. exactly. Yeah, yeah. Well, so today, um, from what I've found anyway, more than 55 million people read, inverted commas, <laughs> an audio book a year, and readers can choose from over 35,000 books. That's just on the uh, that's just on the Audible website. But there's also there's loads of different devices and applications: iPads, desktops, Kindles, free applications like CD versions and players, um, it'll, it'll, like Hoopla, and yeah, Overdrive through it, it, local library systems, and yeah. of course the Daisy Players for the Blind. You know, ultimately because they're digital, they are way more accessible. Mm. So, like, regardless of what platform they're found on, you mm. know, I'll do a lot more research into um, potentially filling in some people on some other platforms that they might not know about as well. You know, I'll, we can do a little section of another um, episode that might cover some other stuff like that. Might be a bit informative. Totally. For I mean, I, I would say Audible actually has three hundred and fifty thousand audiobooks, if not more, now. But a lot of those oh, really? books, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm we, so so we <laughs> have so Audiobooks New Zealand has two hundred and twenty eight thousand audiobooks. Yeah, on I was going to ask currently. you that. I couldn't find that um, on the website. I was going to. Yeah, ask we you we that. don't kind of advertise what our, our, our number is that much, but it's it's always constantly growing because we've got a lot of content coming on the platform all the time. But yeah, you sure. know, uh, and then you know we've only. Since we've got going, we've only probably produced or helped distribute about fifty or sixty New Zealand titles. You know, not a lot. Um, but on on our platform, we then have all the other New Zealand titles that other New Zealanders or self published New Zealanders have published or distributed um, through our partner Findaway. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, the, but we don't know the New Zealanders. You know what I mean? Yes. Like, yeah, so totally. we actually need. So if you if you have a book out there, please let me know. Uh, contact us at Audiobooks in New Zealand, and we'll, we will we will class you as a New Zealand title because we would love to know. But yeah, yeah there's, mi- there's there, there is there's literally hundreds of thousands of titles out there at the moment, but they are you know we probably share in common with Audible 150,000 titles. You know, mm. what, you know what I yeah, mean? Yeah, right. Um, well, and this is I mean this is interesting. I mean it does. This is kind of why I can understand the reticence of publishers to get involved, like um, just because of how how accessible it is digitally. Do you know mm. what I mean? Like, mm. and how many books there are out there. You know, I'm kind of like I, I can understand their reticence. Um, there has been a little bit of a decline in ebook and obviously in actual book sales as well. Um, but that'll be another episode later, of course, as well. <laughs> but it seems that audiobook sales are pretty much creaming it. You know, yeah, and, they're, they're on a constant but, and, increase at the moment. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So in terms of, you know, obviously it is amazing that they're really um, accessible by way of multiple digital platforms and things. But yeah, it is. I, I, you know, obviously the actual monetization of that and the question of um, what sort of return authors get or what or what return publishers get, you know, that's a huge, huge convoluted conversation. Oh, but, totally. And that's you know, where we a, and that's where Audiobooks New Zealand comes into it. You know, I mean, uh, you know, that's that's why we started because you know, there's there's so many services out there now, and and yeah. and Audible and and the big guys have done such fantastic stuff for the industry, mm. but for little countries like us here in New Zealand, um, you know, we we aren't treated so fantastically in in that big digital space. Yeah, so totally. so we we set up Audiobooks NZ. So you know, you know, as a New Zealander. If you go and buy a New Zealand title, that the author is actually getting a, a good chunk of that that yeah. money in their pocket because they, you know, um, otherwise you're you're basically giving all your money away to a, an overseas company. Unfortunately, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, so yeah, uh, it's, 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 it's 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 coming to that stage. You know, what's your favorite bookshop and what are the ethics? <laughs> you know, yes, totally, yeah. absolutely, yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's oh, yeah. I don't know. This um, the stat was just from. Um, uh, f- just from the US alone in 2016, but it was um, audiobook sales being 2.1 billion dollars, and that's like that. That's awesome. That to mm. me is great. Mm. What what what's scary is when that's next to 1.8 billion in terms of hard 
copy books. Yes. Like that to me is like that's huge, man. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that is a that is a that 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 shows a significant trend, you know. So yeah. but 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 because of that I sort of go, well, then shouldn't publishers be chomping at the bit to get involved, you know? Yes. I don't know. It's a big conversation. Again, we'll have it. Yeah, we'll have yeah, it it's again. a big conversation <laughs> and it, and there's lots of moving parts to it and and, yes. and you know, I would be happy to come back on your show and, and, and chat about it with maybe maybe some people from the, the New yeah, Zealand Publishers absolutely. Association and we can talk because what it boils down to is copyright and, and you know, all that sort of stuff and totally. it's very complex. And all of those things. Very, very complex. Yes, yes. Well, so they're not just more accessible now, um, obviously, but the range and the amount of content available, obviously, you know, back in the history lesson, we, we see that people were limited to four minutes, which is obviously no good for a book. <laughs> you know, it's um, now... Not it's, even it's, a podcast. It's, it's not even a podcast. Yeah. <laughs> it's massively vast and it just keeps rising. Um, it's, it's, it's become a faster way to distribute and it's become pretty commonplace for narrators like myself to spend... A hell of a lot of time in their wardrobes, you know? <laughs> like like we said, usually around like eleven hours ish for a yes. finished eight hour ish book. So, yes. <laughs> I mean, and like here, even um, uh, RNZ just last year launched its own platform for children's audiobooks, Storytime. Mm. You know, um, and you guys, Audiobooks NZ, you host you know hundreds of thousands of titles, mm. all you know written and spoken by Kiwis, largely. Mm. You know, I imagine. Um, so the potential for what they're heading towards within the audiobook genre, I suppose is also kind of being tested with these multicast talent performances and things like that. Um, and also more and more celebrities are increasingly, you know, keen to voice an audio book. Why not? And all of that, you know, um, the, the, the majority are still from what I gather read by specific audiobook readers or, um, working narrators, writers, voice artists, actors, that kind of thing. So, I mean, I don't think it's a medium that's ever going to go away and no. level off like we've seen with eBooks, but I think it's, just going to keep expanding and testing its own boundaries the the same way that i don't know in in my opinion i suppose any artistic technological advancement we've seen to date really you know Mm, mm. um and i think and i think mm. as as a nation for new zealand as we embrace audiobooks more and more and and well not that we don't already but as we embrace locally made content more and more i think more well, more more topics and types of audio content will be put into audiobook form, such as learning yeah. materials and you know, um, you know, uh, year eleven textbooks or you yeah. know, like 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 they did in the early days, you know, with starting off with with users manuals and like you know all this, yeah, you know, totally. I think. I think there is a place for that kind of stuff. Um, uh, you know, people would love to be able to listen to, you know, things like that. Um, yeah. It's just well, it's about- all about what's, what's current for people and what's yeah. actually going yeah. on. Yeah. And, you know, unless it's fiction. Yeah. It's, you know, anything of interest is anything that's current, I suppose. Mm-hmm. Hey. I mean, the beauty of a fiction audio book is actually – they have huge a huge life you know whereas yes. whereas you know a printed book you know uh you may do you know um 20,000 copies you know yes, and and totally. and then and when they're all, all gone they're all gone the and yeah 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 and whereas an audio book actually does you know will, will be there on a platform in a library you know for for you know 50 years 60 years and be still accessible just like it was when it was first put on the shelves totally you know? and just like any of the snippets that you know yeah. we've played earlier in the show like you know like the fact that we can just find those yes and they're living you know living um breathing sort of um examples of these of these individuals you yes. know i yeah. i don't know for me it's really and i find i suppose within my work at least i find it I find it really fun to do, but it's, I mean, because it, it is like essentially a daily performance job, but. Yes. Um, um, but I just love them because they've got, there's so much humanity in an audio book, you know, if it's done well, oh, um, you yeah. know, and you it really do, ca- yeah, yeah, you capture a sense of emotion and time and place and, and it's not. And the story and whatever, you know, you're, you're, you're telling. So there's so many elements to an audio book that may not have come across in the printed version, you know. Yeah, um, totally. Absolutely. Which I love. It's, yeah. it's almost three-dimensional, even though it's not. <laughs> I know, I know. And it's, I mean, it is interesting to listen. I think, you know, that's sort of, I think, where, where I was heading to in terms of that, that um, humanity side of things. I mm. think when you, when you can hear someone's voice, intimately in your ear you know Mm. you do develop a real close connection to that Mm. you know and even even being able to hear 
Thomas Edison's voice. I mean, mm. okay, why yeah. not? Like that's yeah. actually his voice. Yeah, cool. yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, you know, that, that's 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 amazing. And uh, you know, in terms of um, just the human kind of psyche around that as well, I think you know most people if they've lost someone that's passed, the thing they want to do is hear their voice. You know, totally, totally. So it's something that's it's it's it is it is something that is. Um, is an incredibly potent storyteller, and the better the performer is that you've got doing it, I think um, the sort of more, better, more connected you are. Yeah, the more connected you can be. You know, yeah. people get people get impassioned about it with you. you it's know? like it's like when you listen to uh, yeah, when, you know, Stephen Fry is a fantastic you know narrator, yes, and he and he's totally. done huge amounts for Audible, and 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 he he's been very passionate audiobook advocate for many 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 years. Yes. and it's like when you listen to him reading one of his books. Um, uh, and you kind of get to the, you finish listening to this book and you feel like, you know, Stephen Fry, yes, like you've had totally. this, like he's been sitting there telling you the story about, you know, whatever it is, um, which is, is amazing. You know, yeah. I think, um, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's an awesome gift to give to people. Eh? I is. mean, in terms of my work at the blind foundation, I sort of, sorry, blind low vision NZ. Um, I can't like, it's, it's, it's more like you sort of think about it as providing, the most cinematic experience yes. that you can in yeah. and around words, yeah. you know? Yeah. So like for people who sometimes have absolutely no point of reference to scenes, landscapes, colours, um, but who basically rely solely on tone and what you say or or what, what you don't say, you know, to yeah. get their kind of story fix, so to speak. But. Totally. I mean, I when I was a, a spotty teenager, um, uh, I, I went to film school in Australia and, and uh, I remember sitting in a, in a, a cinematography class and mm. um and because it was an Australian film school, they were playing as Australian uh, movies, yeah. Um, which I didn't really know, to be honest. I was this, you know, I was the 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 lone Kiwi in a room full of Australians, and um uh, and would they played us a film uh, without the audio, and they said, okay, what happened in this scene, you know? And we kind of got like one or two things correct, and in, in a kind of a checklist of about ten, and then they yeah. and then they played us this a different scene from a different movie, but just the audio, no no sound. So that was with the sound score and the and the conversations mm. there, and we got like seven to eight points of that, you know, ten points. You know, we we, we basically yeah, nearly right. nailed it just from the audio. You know, and they were saying, you know, so the sound lecturer at the time said to us, you know, look, and so never let a cinematographer <laughs> tell you that sound isn't important when you're on a film set, you know, um, because it's so crucial yeah, to so telling true. that story. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, mate. Well, <laughs> yes. well, we've covered where we've come from. We've covered, you know, what we're up to at the moment, I suppose. And, you know, goodness only knows where we can go from here. Yes. But, um, I mean, I hope, I hope that, you know, listeners have found something of, of interest in this wee history sesh, uh, especially if you're someone who does have a vast collection in your audio library um, or is a lover of the cannons and tombs. I mean, just just imagine having to cart it in a bloody wheelbarrow. Oh, my God. You know? <laughs> I mean, I'm a lover of long content. You know? I do like it. I, this is just... It's, quite quite amazing to think of the fact that i'm as privileged as i am now to be able to listen to it with as much ease as i have so totally. you know don't have to change the tape pretty much every single page madness <laughs> <laughs> uh, brilliant all right well next time we're going to be taking a little bit of a look into a massive question that seems to be the cause for continual debate in the industry which is the whole does listening to an audiobook actually count as much as reading it Thanks a lot for joining us. I'm Romy Hooper. You've been listening to Sound Salad for all things spoken and all things heard. To hear more Sound Salad episodes, go to www.soundsalad.co.nz. This has been brought to you by my gold sponsor, Audiobooks NZ. Check out their library at www.audiobooksnz.co.nz.